What's going on guys? My name is Coyote Peterson, host of the Brave Wilderness YouTube channel, and I'm a huge fan of the How to Train Your Dragon film franchise. I think we can all agree that the filmmakers did a phenomenal job with the design of the dragons. However, one aspect that's always astonished me has been the animator's ability to make the dragons fly, as if they're real living creatures. Now, given my observations of winged animals in our world, like bats and birds, I'm always on the lookout for subtle, yet massively important details when it comes to depicting flight on screen. So with that in mind, let's take a look at some of the animals that have helped inspire the art of dragon flight. There's a lot of research that went into the, the flight mechanics of these dragons. Our animators did a lot of tests, and there's a rigorous training module that they all have to go through when they join the How to Train Your Dragon films, which is called Flight School. Flight School was designed basically with some very simple lectures about animal anatomy and the physics of flight. It's where you really study the movement of wings from birds and bats, um, understanding the lift to believably convey flight. But if you look at the Gronkle, he flaps his wings almost like a hummingbird, um, and it allows him to sort of hover. Whereas Toothless was meant to be very flight worthy. So he was designed actually with a sparrow in mind, um, and he, he needed to be very dynamic. And we gave him kind of a translucent membrane uh, between the, the wing fingers, almost like a bat. And that allows him to kind of catch and control the air currents in a different way than, say, Astrid's dragon, which is a deadly natter. It has very bird-like qualities, and so we leaned a little bit more into a parrot. Often our shots were going to be filmed against blue sky, so we had to sell the presence of air, like turbulence, and lift, and drag, and what, how does a wing actually beat? And it's not what you picture or the way you draw it as a child, where it just kind of goes up and down. It's actually a complex rotation. It's a large creative pool to draw from, and we tried to make sure that every dragon had very unique abilities, even down to the design of the wings. We wanted people to believe in these dragons, we wanted to believe in their physicality, in their reality. We wanted to believe that flying was actually difficult and dangerous. We wanted to create, obviously, a broad sense of design possibilities for our dragons. We needed that because we had so many different types. These animators, they had to prove to everybody that, okay, here's how flight works, and I believe that this dragon really exists. We want it to be magical. Who wants to go to dragon flight school? I know I do. But how cool would that be? Sitting on the back of a dragon like Toothless, soaring through the air and defending your Viking kingdom. And after watching a behind the scenes video like that, I think we all certainly have a new appreciation for all the research and the science that goes into lifting all of our favorite dragons up into the air. Hi there, my name is Coyote Peterson, host of the Brave Wilderness YouTube channel. And if you're watching this video, it means that, like me, you're a huge fan of the How to Train Your Dragon film franchise. As a matter of fact, I've seen all the movies multiple times. Now, one aspect that has always fascinated me has been the design of the dragons. Even as animations, they're so incredibly lifelike. And I'm not just talking about the main characters. Each and every creature fits perfectly into Burke, the Viking world they live in. But have you ever wondered where the filmmakers found their inspirations for the dragon's designs? Let's find out. When it came to designing the dragons, what we really tried to do was just combine known animals uh, and their, their specific attributes with something that would be unrelated. Toothless, for example, was the combination of a black panther and a salamander. Not a combination that you would really expect, but it actually gave us kind of a mammalian influence. Every dragon has some sort of inspiration outside of just the reptilian world. Hobgoblers are the French bulldogs of our director, Dean. I have French bulldogs, so they were part of the design of this, this character. They're based on a French bulldog 
combined with like a tree frog. Gah! One, two, three, four, and five. And to add to it, part of the voice of the hobgoblers is my Frenchie, Gordy. Now, who's hungry? <laughs> Any idea of dragons we might have, we wanted to fit it into our style. So find the basic shapes that represent a certain type of animal and then turn it into a dragon. Cloud Jumper, for example, uh, who is Valka's dragon, was largely based on the attributes of an owl. Bronkel is really supposed to be a big grumpy walrus, and mixed with reptilian traits. In the Light Fury, Dean's key instruction was I sh it should feel a little bit like Light Fury is the lioness. So we looked at snow leopards. The Light Fury! She's following us! Death Grippers are the evil dragons. They're pure evil. So we took a lot of references of all the things that are kind of scary to us, like scorpions, for example. And it's an obvious reference, actually, when you see their tail curling up with a stinger. The gore gutter was actually based on a great elk, this ancient elk, and its rack of antlers was so impressive. They looked like they're about 12 feet across. Uh, very impractical, but <laughs> we thought it might be a nice inspiration to explore a dragon that we hadn't seen before. At the time, I mean, we didn't know exactly how to, to bring that into a design, but that's literally starting with the antlers and then little by little, you know, creating the shape of, uh, I mean, what was left of the dragon. The design aesthetic and the, the, the overall feel we were going for was one of physical accuracy in the sense that we wanted you to believe that these dragons existed at one point on this planet, uh, that they share traits with animals we now know. And it makes everything much more credible. Wow, I would have never guessed the Toothless was part salamander and part Black Panther. How cool is that? So now when you go back and rewatch the films, you'll be able to recognize how the natural world of animals helped inspire the imaginary universe of dragons.